Okay, so we as a group, myself, Dana, and Pam here, are going to summarize what we've been working on in this case example. So just to clarify, our original question is there evidence for or against the use of Hemiwalker for gait training acutely post-stroke? Specifically in this case, how will we decide the best assistive, assistive device for our patient? What we've done is we took a look at the evidence-based practice model. We first wanted to consider the research evidence. We then looked at the clinical experience and gained information from clinicians, including a student of physical therapy, as well as an expert clinician. And then we also wanted to consider this idea of the patient preference. So we chose to look at this from an ICF perspective when speaking with the clinicians. And this is something that we all know. We could think of this as our health condition is a, a hemorrhagic stroke. As we see this patient walking, as we hear what the patient wants to do, what might we think about from body functions and body structure? What are the activity levels that might be impairing these individuals? And what are the participation level concerns that we might have? We also recognize that there are environmental factors and personal factors that need to come into this case. If we think about what the what our speakers address with us, when we started with the body structure and function, I cited hemiparesis, balance or stability concerns, lack of awareness, including safety and fall risk concerns, and right knee pain. We next considered as we got a little bit deeper into our thinking as our NCS was um, re responding, she started to think, well, maybe it's a fractionated movement deficit and how is that impacting the patient's deficit? I definitely, she said, I want to do a gait analysis. And she said, I also need to consider the cardiovascular status of this individual. So we start to really get a strong base of hypotheses for what we need to be assessing in our evaluation. We also recognize that we have functional limitations. We see that this individual has decreased walking speed and that their activities of daily living may be impaired. This could be something as simple as maneuvering around the house, showering, bathing, um, walking to the dining room, transfers, etc. Then one, another concern that we recognize is that this person is isolated. They have limited community access. And we also recognize from other uh, levels that this caregiver we need to consider. What are the caregiver's concerns and how might that impact our choice of an assisted device for this individual? So if we were to put all that together, I've created here the evidence-based practice model. And when we think about this, let's start with the idea of the patient preference. You first meet your patient and you say, what was it that you would like to do? Or coming into your client about three years post-stroke, I want to walk independently at home. You see that they have a hemi walker. And next, you might say, well, gosh, is that going to be the best assistive device that I need to be providing for this patient? So if you go to the literature, what you find is when considering assistive devices, I might want to consider gait speed, endurance, and balance. And before we head into that last part about clinical experience, I want to... Um, work with Pam and Dana here and discuss a little bit about this piece of making how we might make this leap from patient preference to research and how that might impact our decision making. I consider this one of the key pieces rather than thinking about my clinical experience first. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I, I think it's really interesting how um, a little bit different perspective from the NCS who's had lots of experience. Um, she could kind of see beyond the client himself and see that he's socially isolated and things like that. So there are things that we need to think about kind of beyond um, the patient himself and um, to try to provide a plan of care that's really salient to that, to that patient. And kind of working backwards from their patient preference to what is keeping him from doing these things. Is that body structure and function? Do we need to check out that knee pain? or other functional activities. It's kind of, um, that's that what speaks to me from the difference in, in those two interviews. I'm not sure if it speaks directly to um, the point that Dana just made, but I'm realizing that I would like to know more about his comfort level with the Hemiwalker. Does he perceive that as a barrier and, and um, what's his perception of his balance and his ability to walk even within his home? He's, he's been in, you know, it's been three years since his stroke and he, he probably definitely has 
a perception of, you know, he has an opinion about it. And if, would he be open to trying something new or does he feel like this meets his needs for sure? Yeah, I think we need to ask the patient some more questions. You know, what you're saying, you're not walking independently. Why are you not walking? Do you have, is it right knee pain? Is your caregiver scared? Do you have decreased endurance? You know, what do they feel? And that kind of lets me drive the process of, oh, I see now you're describing a balance problem. Then uh, a uh, functional limitation to look at bird balance or an activities balance confidence. Absolutely. Because we know that when people don't have confidence in their balance, then they are going to self-limit their mobility for sure. Along that line, I was thinking we could address the cardiovascular endurance through a stationary bike. And potentially, if he is motivated, that's something that he could even use in his home or in a community gym setting if he can get there. And if if his real goal is to get out in the community more, is it worth exploring other means of mobility and then separately addressing um, his level of fitness in a different way? I love that idea, Pam, because sometimes people are limited by their cardiovascular because they're deconditioned. It really may not have anything to do or not as much to do with the hemiplegia and the stroke as it is just general deconditioning that can be improved by doing cardiovascular exercise. What about the um, hemi walker, right? We kind of learned that that's not going to be best for increasing his gait speed or endurance. Um, and I, I would say that we can certainly improve the cardiovascular status regardless and however he chooses to use it. I would then have to say, which of these devices do you like that makes you and your patient and the caregiver and your home setting? It may be that maybe this is a better tool for the community. Hmm, that's interesting. So you're suggesting that maybe the Hemi Walker would be a good um, assistive device for the community? I am. I'm particularly thinking that for everyone's safety. So he, he could actually walk around potentially on his own. When I think of a Hemi walker, I really think it's for that balance and safety piece. And it's probably it might be a little cumbersome in the home. So we might want to go down um, in in the level of assistance. Right. And to that point, we had talked earlier about a uh, rolling walker. And that would be even more cumbersome in the home if there are restrictions and it would be difficult to use in the community. Yeah, I would be all for um, moving toward uh, quad cane, for example. Yeah, that actually sounds like, I mean, a great idea. Let's make sure everyone's comfortable with a quad cane. Yeah, and constantly reassessing because if you're comfortable with a quad cane, In a closed, quiet environment, that's great. But like you said, if it's a more open environment that's busier out in the community, maybe it's safer to use the Hemi Walker. Yes. And I also don't, we can't forget that this person we're probably going to have to see again in two years, thinking that that's where we left them um, after inpatient rehab with a um, Hemi Walker. We probably should have said, no, you need to get back in a year later and really let's change and continue to allow everything to progress, knowing that they can improve. Right. I th- yeah, that's such a good point about letting people work with a device and then coming back sort of for a tune-up or to readjust their program. And this person shows motivation to do that because he has sought physical therapy and he has sought outpatient physical therapy in the past as well. So that speaks to his drive and desire to be as functional as possible. Absolutely. Rehab does not end just when you leave um, inpatient rehab. It's got to continue on. So I I totally agree. Six months or every year checkups and and tune-ups and assessing issues and trying to help the patient um, make the most out of their life and um, work on the salient activities that can help them, you know, enjoy their life. Yeah. And those change with time and with age. Fantastic um, conversation here. I think uh, this kind of gives us a lot to think about, this decision-making where we really are including all of this into our evidence-based practice model. It's very fun to discuss these things and really see how you can get deeper and deeper and making those right choices for each patient who's going to be a little bit different each time. 